there are three categories of young uh, people when we talk about non-communicable diseases and conditions. I am going to be focusing on two uh, because uh, Crystal Boyer is going to be speaking to the third. And the third, which really is the first, are those who acquire chronic diseases in childhood that then bring uh, them into adolescence. The second uh, category uh, that uh, I'll uh, talk about here are uh, those that acquire non-communicable diseases in adolescence. And what we see, for example, is that uh, for adolescents, nearly 5% of uh, 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 young people, by the time they reach age of 20, will have hypertension. Of those who are obese, one out of four will have uh, the precursors of diabetes. And in fact, seven out of ten will have the precursors of cardiovascular disease. We are laying the seeds for bankrupting our health care systems in every country in the world. Asthma, one in ten. That has gone up as a function of pollutants. It's gone up as a function uh, of uh, the living uh, situation in which many young people find themselves. And trauma. Uh, and that includes self-inflicted trauma, uh, uh, injuries, uh, and interpersonal violence. I'll expand on that in a moment. Next, please. In work that uh, uh, my uh, colleagues uh, and I have uh, done when I was at the University of Minnesota, we looked at um, using the uh, National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Health, three categories of young people with uh, chronic conditions. Those uh, who have emotional disabilities, those with mobility impairments, and those with learning disabilities. And we asked the question, compared to those without chronic conditions, what is the likelihood of having uh, significant uh, uh, social and emotional uh, problems. Well, when we look, and I, I would just decode this to say uh, the pluses represent levels of significance from uh, 0.05, 1 plus, to 0.01, to 0.001. So they're highly significant. You look at suicide attempts across the board, more significant, uh, significant among those with chronic conditions. Cigarette use more common. Alcohol use, except for those with learning impairments, uh, more common. Marijuana use for those uh, with emotional disabilities, less true for others. Sexual debut under the age of 12, more common. So what we see is a constellation of behaviors that are um, intercorrelated with chronic conditions. Next, please. Uh, the second category that I would like to talk about are those adolescent conditions that are the precursors of adult chronic diseases. And I think the uh, photograph of the young woman uh, who is significantly overweight smoking a cigarette um, uh, captures well the image. And I uh, think that Jane Ferguson spoke to some of those issues. Next, please. Half of all adult NCDs have their origins in adolescence. I would suggest this makes it compelling to address issues uh, in youth. If we will stand a chance of not having to pick up the bill at the back end, the bill in terms of morbidity, mortality, and finances, a decline in exercise. Jane showed uh, exercise levels as young people and this is true country by country, go from childhood to adolescence, their exercise levels decline steadily. Uh, increase in calorie consumption. In the United States, calorie, uh, mean calorie consumption over the last 30 years has gone up uh, over 1,000 kilocalories in one generation as exercise has declined. <coughs> increase in affective disorders, emotional disorders, as uh, the work of George Patton and others have shown, 75% of affective disorders have their onset by the age of 25. 75%. Early unprotected intercourse predisposes to a whole range of issues, whether it's HPV, HIV, 
uh, adolescent pregnancy. Tobacco use, as Jane has spoken to, alcohol consumption and drug use and low birth weight inf infants who uh, are predisposed to adult cardiovascular disease, as David Barker uh, has uh, so brilliantly shown. Next, please. Uh, so what does the new science teach us? And uh, just to, to put this in, in, in context, um, for example, when I trained in medical school, I was taught that brain development stopped when your hat size becomes fixed. For those who don't know when your hat size becomes fixed, it's when your skull stops growing, which is about the age of two and a half. So they said, well, how could the brain continue to grow? There ain't no room here to grow. But it does continue to grow well into the 20s. And for those of us who happen to be over the age of 25, there is good news because from research that's been done out of Britain and elsewhere, brain development can continue well into uh, the 50s and 60s. Next, please. So we see that brain development continues at least until uh, uh, 25. The part of the brain that develops is the prefrontal cortex, the part that controls rational decision making, emotional regulation. Uh, and things of that nature. The adolescent brain is still plastic, which means it can change. The ability to influence adolescence remains substantial at a cellular level as well as at a social level. Next, please. I'm sorry, you could back up. Uh, the reward center of uh, the brain develops before the inhibitory centers. So. Young people, adolescents, are much more susceptible to uh, rewards and far less susceptible than children or adults to punishment. Hmm. What does that mean as we think about strategies, if this is a biologic reality? And sensation seeking in adolescents has a neurologic basis. There are many adaptive reasons why uh, uh, young people are sensation seekers. Next, please. So, adolescents are social and biologic creatures of their environment. A number of us had the opportunity this morning to be at a launch of uh, a, a new uh, Lancet series that, on adolescents that uh, is uh, being released uh, later today. And uh, one of the things that became crystal clear from across the various papers from around the world is that the social context in which young people live determine their morbidity and mortality. And that both makes it very complicated for us, but very important for us to understand the environment. Next, please. So I want to just briefly talk, and it's far beyond what can be done uh, in uh, uh, 37 seconds. But I want to talk about how the environment alters biology, not just our social forces, but it alters the biologic construct. I don't know how many of you read uh, uh, US, USA Today. Uh, I do only when I'm staying in hotels. It slipped under the door. Uh, and uh, this morning, front page. Violence ages children's DNA. Violence ages children's DNA. Growing up in persistently violent environments not only changes your social values, it changes your biology. How does that work? So the way it seems to work, next please, is that on a gene sequence, and gene sequences are pretty immutable. They're you know, they're passed on and on uh, from mom, from dad, but there are control switches, little group, methyl groups, and those switches turn on and off genes, and those switches are heavily influenced by the environments in which young people live. So, for example, we see that nutrition can alter uh, gene expression without changing the gene structure. I'll show you uh, uh, an example of this in a second with fat yellow mice. Uh, the association 
of the Dutch famine with schizophrenia. Fascinating. In three cities in Holland, during a three-month period of time, during 1944, when famine was most extreme, women who uh, became pregnant had children who, when they entered adolescence, 13 to 15 years later, had higher, three times or more, higher prevalence uh, of uh, schizophrenia than the average population. How is that possible? That nutritional deprivation of mothers predisposes to schizophrenia. Malnutrition among uh, pregnant uh, women uh, in the United States during the Civil War, during the Great Depression, has been shown to have these effects. We've seen it in other uh, uh, studies as well. Next, please. So, just one example, but a very graphic example. Uh, uh, these uh, five mice uh, are genetically identical. They are what we would call twins. You look at them and you say, they're twins? I mean, there's the fat yellow mouse on the left side, the skinny brown mouse on the right side. What makes the difference if they are genetically identical? And what makes the difference is whether the control switch, the epigenetics control for obesity is turned on or turned off, whether the control switch for skin color is on or off. And what controls that? Nutrition uh, will influence methylation, those control switches. So nutrition, what you eat, can impact the way you look, not just because of socially, but because of biologic changes as well. To me, this raises a warning sign of what are we doing for the next five or ten generations that if in fact behaviors can be transmitted epigenetically and if in fact the controls for genes are passed in, from environmental context on to multiple generations where are we going? Next please. So the key messages from the new science vulnerability stems from the interactions of biology behaviors and environment pathways are identifiable. As Jane again said, we know a bunch of these things that can map how the factors of beha or behaviors affect others that lead to this negative cascade. The adolescent brain is malleable, plastic, so it's open to other interventions. Uh, that the behaviors that predispose to NCDs are not just socially learned behaviors, but they are epigenetically controlled as well, which to me makes these issues even more pressing and even more critical. The expression of the gene is affected by the environment in which a young person lives. Growing up in persistent, violent environments alters your biology, not just your behavior. We're learning new things all the time that are not reflected in policies and programs. Finally, I'd like to just elaborate very quickly on some of the things that Aunt Jane said. We know a number of things that make a difference. We know that policy matters. We have ample evidence that we're controlling advertising, for example, with tobacco and with uh, uh, food targeted to younger children. We know taxation, and particularly adolescents are price sensitive to tobacco and alcohol products, drinking laws, driving laws. Graduated driver's licenses for adolescents in the United States has reduced automotive fatalities by 40%. 40%. We know you can uh, implement policy. School programs uh, matter. Health promoting schools, mental health promoting schools, physical activities, uh, 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 and life skills training. Uh, in the New Lancet series, uh, 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 Professor Catalano and his colleagues 
uh, lay out a, a lot of what we know about these kinds of interventions. We know that clinical services matter particularly around contraception access, alcohol, uh, and uh, tobacco. We know that families matter and remain critically important for adolescents. Parents' supports, clear expectations, and parental monitoring being the three key factors. And finally, we know that media matters in the normative Im images that it projects, in advertising, in video games, in social media, and in news reporting. We know a lot. The question is, are we prepared to help young people not become the adults that their parents are becoming today? Thank you very much.